Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Lightweight Java Game Library 3D Game Tutorial. And this week we're going to be using uniform variables and learning about how matrices are used in game engines. Before we start on the new stuff, there's a few problems that people have brought to my attention, so we just need to fix a couple of things first. If you go first into the shader program class and go to the constructor, this bind attributes method is being called in the wrong place. This actually has to be called before the program is linked, otherwise it doesn't work properly. So it should now be bind attributes and then GL link program. Secondly, if you go into the display manager class to this bit of code from the very first tutorial, I found out that setting the context attributes has to be done all in one line like this. So it should be new context attributes dot with forward compatible dot with profile core. So now we can get on with some new stuff. And first off this week, I want to talk about uniform variables. Before I explain what they are and why we use them, we need to remind ourselves of how the shaders are set up. So as you all know by now, we have a vertex and a fragment shader. The inputs to the vertex shader come from attributes in a VAO, which the vertex shader uses to determine some per vertex outputs. These outputs are then passed on to the fragment shader, which interpolates them and uses them to determine the output color of each pixel of the object. And this is all good and well, but you may notice that the only input to this whole system comes from the model data in the VAO. This means that the only way to change the behavior of the shaders would be to change the data in the VAO, but this is a bit of a problem. We're going to want things other than just model data to affect the way that a model is rendered, such as light positions and brightnesses, environmental fog, glow from the sun, and many other factors. We also don't want to have to change the model VAO every time we want to move or rotate the model either, so we need another way to change the behavior of the shaders. That's where uniform variables come in. Uniform variables are variables in the shader code that can be set from our Java code at any time. This means that we can send information at any time to either one or both the shaders to change the way that objects are rendered. This gives us the ability to calculate variables such as sun position, light intensity or fog density in the Java code and then send these variables to the shaders so that they can use these values in their program. Let's now go into the code and implement some of what I've been talking about. So there are two main things that we need to do in the Java code when it comes to managing uniform variables. When we load up the shaders right at the start when we load up the game, we need to get the location of all the uniform variables in the shader code and store these locations. Then we also need methods that can be called at any time that will allow us to load up values from our Java program to these locations of the uniform variables in the shader code. So let's start off in the shader program class and the first thing we're going to do is create a method that can get the location of a uniform variable in shader code. So this is going to take in a string which is the name of the uniform variable as it appears in the shader code and it's going to return an int uh, that represents the location of that uniform variable. And all we have to do here is call the method gl20.gl get uniform location which takes in the program ID of the program in which the uniform variable is found and then the uniform's name. We're also going to add here uh, an abstract method called get all uniform locations and this is just to make sure that all shader program classes will have a method that gets all the uniform locations and to make sure that this is called whenever the shader program is loaded up, we're going to call it from this class's constructor. So now we need a few methods that can load up values to these uniform locations. And there's a load of different types of values that we're going to want to load up. Uh, the simplest is just going to be to load up a float. And this will take in the location of that uniform variable, which should be a float variable and it's going to take in the value that we want to load to that uniform. And to do this we just call the, the method gluniform1f which needs the location of the uniform and the value that you want to load into that uniform. We'll also create a method to load up a vector into a uniform. So if we have a, a vec3 uniform variable in the shader code we can load up a vector into that variable 
by calling this method, which takes in the location of that vec3 uniform variable and the vector that we want to load into it. And uh, we just have to call gl uniform 3f, because this time it's three floats, takes in the location of that vec3 variable in the shader code, and then the x, y, and z components of the vector that we want to load to it. Uh, we're also going to make a method that can load up uh, a boolean. Now in shader code there isn't really uh, a boolean, so we're just going to load up either a 0 or a 1. So we're just going to load up a float value of either 0 or 1, depending on whether it's true or false. So first we'll uh, decide on what float value we want to load up. So if it's true we'll load up a 1, if it's false we'll just load up a 0, and then we'll call that same GL uniform 1F method to load up one float to that location in the shader code. And finally the last type of uh, uniform variable is uh, a matrix. So if we want to load a matrix into the shader code into a, a mat4 uniform variable. Uh, we need the location of that uniform variable and the matrix that we want to load to it. This is a bit more complicated. We actually need a float buffer to load up matrices. So let's create a float buffer up the top that we can reuse every time we want to load up a matrix into the shader code. And we'll create this using bufferutils.createFloatBuffer and because we're going to be using 4x4 four four matrices, uh, that's going to be 16 floats. Don't worry if that doesn't make any sense to you if you've never used matrices bef before. I'm going to be explaining them later. Um, but yeah, to load a matrix into the shader code, we first need to store it into that matrix buffer, that float buffer. We need to flip the float buffer to get it ready to be read from. And then we load it up into the location of that uniform variable. So we use GL uniform matrix 4, takes in the location, takes in whether we want to transpose it or not, which we don't, so we put false, and then it takes in that float buffer containing the matrix. So let's now do a quick example of how we can use these methods that we've just created. So let's go into the vertex shader and actually create a uniform variable in there. This is going to be a, a matrix a uniform mat4 and we're going to call this variable transformation matrix. I'll explain why later and what it's used for, but for now just know that it's a uniform called transformation matrix. So let's implement that get all uniform locations method and in here we have to of course get the location of all the uniforms in our shader code and we've only got one and it was called transformation matrix. And this method of course returns the location of that uniform which we need to store, we need to remember that location if we ever want to load anything up to it. So let's create a class variable called location, an instance variable called location transformation matrix which we will set to the location of that uniform variable. And now let's create a method that can load a matrix, uh, load up a transformation matrix to that uniform variable. So we'll take in a matrix that we want to load up to the transformation matrix uh, variable in the vertex shader code. And we already have a method to do this. We just have to call super.loadMatrix, takes in the location of that uniform variable and the matrix that we want to load up to it. So the first thing we're going to be using these uniforms for is to help move our quad around and render it in different places. So we've got a VAO that contains all the positional data about this quad here, but what if we wanted to render the same quad in a different position, or at a different scale? Would we need to create a new VAO for each of these positions with new vertex positions? And what about if we wanted to render the exact same quad multiple times on the screen, but in many different positions and sizes? Would we have to create a whole new VAO for each of these separate quads? Well, Obviously, luckily, the answer is no. We can use the same VAO for each of these quads and then move and resize each quad in the vertex shader using uniform variables and matrices. And that's what I'm going to explain now. So let's imagine we have an object in the 3D world such as this tree. 
Now, there are three things that determine where this model is located in the 3D world. The first of which is an XYZ position, which you could also think of as a translation from the object's original position. We could also rotate our object, and we're going to be representing rotations as an angle of rotation around each of the X, Y, and Z axes, giving us three values for rotation, Rx, Ry, and Rz. Rotations represented in this way are known as Euler rotations. Finally, we can render objects at different sizes, which we can represent with a simple scale value, with a scale value of 1 being the normal object size. These three factors, the translation, rotation and scale of an object, determine how and where that object is rendered. And together these factors are known as the object's transformation, and every entity in our game is going to have its own transformation. So, as I've just shown, we can represent a transformation as a position or translation, a rotation and a scale, but there's another more useful way of representing a transformation, and that is using a 4x4 matrix. And you'll see why this is useful in a bit. If you don't know what matrices are and how they work, it's actually not too much of a problem, uh, but I've put some links in the description about matrix maths if you're interested. This is called a 4x4 matrix because it has 4 rows and 4 columns of numbers, and when it's used to represent a transformation, it can be known as a transformation matrix. You really don't need to know how it represents a transformation or what each of the 16 numbers in the matrix means, although, of course, it wouldn't hurt to know, links are in the description below, but if you want to think of it just as a, a magic box that contains a transformation, then that's fine too. What we do need to know, however, is how we can convert from a translation, rotation and scale to a transformation matrix, and I'll show you how we can do that in the code now. So, we're going to create a new package called Toolbox, and this is where all our useful classes to do useful little methods are going to go. And we're going to create a maths class for all the maths that we're going to be using in our game engine. And of course, the first method that we're going to put in here is the method that we need this week, which is the Create Transformation Matrix. And this is obviously going to return a 4x4 matrix, and it's going to take in the translation, which is a 3D vector. It's then going to take in the three rotation values, Rx, Ry, and Rz, and also the scale value. So, let's just import them. Then the first thing we need to do is to create a new empty matrix, and very simple, new matrix for F. Then we need to set this matrix to the identity matrix, which if you don't know what that means, it just basically resets the matrix. Then we're going to translate the matrix, and if you were worried that you didn't know enough matrix maths to do this, then it's your lucky day, because Lightweight Java Game Library has a load of stuff that does the matrix maths for us. So first we translated the matrix by that translation, now we need to rotate the matrix around each of the three axes. So first we'll rotate its Rx, and we have to convert that to radians, around the X axis which we have to specify in this vector here, so a 1 in the X component and then a 0 in the other two, and we want to rotate the matrix and we'll store it back in matrix, and you'll have to cast that first argument to a float. Then we need to do this two more times, one for each axis, so we're then going to rotate our Y around the Y axis, and finally our Z degrees around the Z axis. So we've now translated and rotated our matrix, and finally all we need to do is to scale it. And first we need to specify the scale in all three uh, axes, and we're just going to scale it uniformly over all in all directions, so we put scale into the vector three times, and we want to scale our matrix and save it in matrix. So now we have our transformation matrix, we just need to return it, and that is how you create a transformation matrix. So next week what we're going to do is to introduce the idea of entities into our code, where each entity has a model, and also a position, rotation and scale that define how and where that model should be rendered. That way, we could render 100 tree entities, each with a different position, rotation and size, but all using the same model. But to achieve this, we'll actually have to apply each entity's transformation to the model vertices at some point before rendering. 
We could do this by editing the VAO every time we want to render the tree model in a different position, and we could apply the transformation to each of the vertices in the VAO, thus moving, rotating and scaling the model before rendering it. However, if we're going to render a forest of 100 trees, that would mean editing the tree model VAO 100 times each frame, which would be very slow. A much better way of doing it would be to transform the vertices in the vertex shader. Every vertex has to come through the vertex shader once each time it's going to be rendered, and so we can transform them in here before they get rendered to the screen. And this is where uniform variables will be really useful, because we'll be able to load up the transformation matrix for each entity that we want to render from the Java code. So to render a forest of 100 trees, what we would need to do would be to render the tree VAO 100 times, but each time load up a different transformation matrix that will determine where that particular tree is rendered. So we'll have the transformation matrix loaded up into this variable here in the vertex shader code, and then we just need to apply the transformation to each vertex position. And this is why matrices are so useful, because to apply this whole transformation to the vertex, so that's translating, rotating, and scaling the vertex, all we need to do is to multiply them together. And this works because the vertex position is a vector, which we made into a 4D vector. And a vector is basically a matrix as well. The transformation matrix is a 4x4 matrix, and the vertex position is a 1x4 matrix. So you could say that a vector is basically just a, uh, a thin matrix. So, I think that's quite enough for this week. You'll be happy to hear that we're almost finished with the basics now, and we'll be moving on to loading models up from Blender and doing exciting lighting functions very soon. Next week, we're going to be moving and rotating a 3D cube using matrices, so look out for that video next Saturday. Don't forget to check out yesterday's devlog video about the item editor program that I programmed last week. It is ever so exciting. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys very much for watching this tutorial. Do give it a like if you can to keep me motivated to make these tutorials. Have a lovely week, and I will see you all next time.